That was Matthew reading Matthew. So, happy Sunday. We want to continue with the preaching of the Gospel of Luke. And today we go on to a section where the actual more detailed teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ began. Uh, prior to this, it was a lot of actions and a lot of chronological events that has been recorded. But from chapter 6 onwards, we do see a collection of the actual a straightforward teaching of Jesus Christ. But let's quickly review what was taught in the last lesson. In the last lesson, we were focusing on what happened when Jesus Christ appeared and the challenges that he has brought with many things on that, on his era, and, and especially in the area of Sabbath or the observance of the day of rest. And this is one of the inevitable things that Jesus Christ and his appearance will bring everywhere that he went at his day. And we started by talking about what the Sabbath day observance is. The word Sabbath is Hebrew for rest. And it really came from Genesis when Genesis 2 talked about how God rested on the seventh day. And I pointed out to you that, of course, God need not rest. And so the Sabbath laws are actually meant for us. It is a reflection that God has given to us that he, we need a design of one day in seven day kind of a rest. At the same time, Exodus 20 listed the Sabbath day observance as the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And so it is not to be taken lightly that God has commanded that we need to keep the Sabbath holy. And so because of that, the Jews, as usual, went to expand this a lot further to all kinds of addition to the original laws. Uh, earlier preaching, I mentioned, for example, that the Third Commandment said, You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. And so what the Jews did was expand it further until you shall not even say the word of, of the Lord. And so instead of saying Yahweh, they will use the word Adonai because they expanded the law a lot more. So the Sabbath law is also another classic example of that. So although the Bible says you shall rest on that day and shall not work, the Jews expanded it to 39 different categories of work. Each category then will further include other categories altogether. And remember, the categories include things like you're not to work in a farm, you're not to we know the things or separate it, separate the husk from, from the grain. And from winnowing comes the idea that you should not pick up bones from the fish as well. I want to thank our brother Jason Suantika who last week pointed out a new thing I learned, that fish and chip was actually part of the, the Sabbath laws and he was right. I went back and checked about it. Apparently, fish and chip was introduced to England by the Jews back many, many years ago because, the Sabbath, because of the Sabbath law. The Jew would go and deep fry the fish on a Friday so that on sun, Saturday itself when they eat the fish, they don't have to pick out the bones or do any kind of work. So it shows you how the impact of such misinterpretation interpretation of Scripture will last all the way from the time of Jesus till today. And so when Jesus' disciples were plucking the grain from the uh, field, the Pharisees and all the experts of the Lord, they were trailing them and were trying to catch them. And so immediately challenged Jesus, why did your disciples do things like that? And so this kind of uh, understanding and is still with us today. And so on the one hand, in churches, oftentimes people are very legalistic about things. Um, there are many different kinds of churches out there. And I pointed out to you that there are some churches that still worship on Saturday. We're taking Sabbath on Saturday. And even your normal church, some churches would take attendance and be very careful and very, very uh, strict about whether you attend or you don't attend and have all kinds of rules and regulations. On the other hand, there are people who then look at the passages that we read about Jesus Christ and the Sabbath to then declare that actually Jesus said that there's no need to observe anything. So they are on the other extreme, this movement called the Unchurching Movement, which advocate that you shouldn't come to an institutionalized church like this. You should just stay at home or maybe go into small house grouping instead of a big church to worship or that it is really not very important to come to church. Just stay at home and, and I don't know, use the internet or whatever it is to watch some pastor preaching and, and church is not important at all. And so, of course, we want to find the answers from our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I point out two main things. Mark Chapter 2, verse 27 gave us this, and Jesus explained it this way. The Sabbath was made for men and not men for Sabbath. 
So we need to be very careful as to the difference between a tool and its purpose. So rather than worship the tool, you must understand the purpose of what the laws of God is for and getting the order right. Remember I told you oftentimes we go for the gifts or instead of the giver. Instead of recognizing God, we go for all these other things that surround it. And this is something that is very ingrained in human behavior. Remember I told you that even people like Jack Ma, after he started his own company, now declare that if he were to go and apply for a job in his own company, he surely will not be hired. Uh, although he started the company being out of the box, you know, very maverick, very unusual kind of a, a character. Now he's uh, one of the richest men in China. But it's quite a shocking statement to say that if I go back to Ali, Alibaba that I've started and try to apply a job, and you look at my my face, look at my my credential, look at my academic qualification, which which are very low, they will never hire me. So it's a very big irony. But that's the way we all are. We often will mix the order up. Up, upside down. But the most important revelation given by the Bible is found when Jesus Christ declared in Luke 6, 5, and he said to them, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so actually Sabbath laws and all the Old Testament points out to Jesus Christ as the Lord of the Sabbath, the ultimate rest. And because of that, we worship God on a Sunday now instead of a Saturday, which is a, a Sabbath day, because Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law, because the Sabbath points to him. And Sunday is the first day of the week where our Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected. And so Protestant churches and even Roman Catholic churches starts to worship God on the first day rather than on the Sabbath to signify that the Lord of the Sabbath has come and he fulfilled all the laws of God. And so it is important for us to then recognize this, not just for services' sake, but that our Lord Jesus Christ must be our ultimate rest as well. And from here comes some of the lessons that we really need to remember. That God designed for humanity is follows a certain rhythm, which is a one day in seven day kind of rest. At least at least one day in a seven-day rest, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And so it is really important for all of us to understand this, and at least even physically and emotionally, to have a proper period of rest. I know a lot of you are workaholics, you work very, very hard. Sometimes it's cultural, sometimes you say you've got no choice, uh, and including my own daughters, you know, they work very hard. And oftentimes you get a bit worried because God did not design us to work like that. If you keep pushing yourself all the time without proper rest, physically, you are going to get into trouble. Emotionally, you're going to get into trouble with your loved ones, with your spouse, with your children that you don't spend any time with. And that's just the rhythm that God has made for us. And of course, spiritually, it's very important to come to the Lord at least once every seven days, and even in every single day, you should have a time set aside in daily devotion. So we don't want to be legalistic about all these things and take your attendance and, and chase after you for not coming to church. But at the same time, do not be delusional and think that if you stay at home, watch internet or catch Pastor Young on YouTube or whatever it is, you will be fine. That's not how it works because we are all fallen beings. And so together as a community of faith, with so many challenges out there, we do need each other to encourage one another as Hebrew tells us. Do not forget to gather together, but come together to stir each other up to good work, to encourage one another, because the days are dark indeed. And now we move on to the next segment of uh, the Gospel of Luke, which, come, which has a lot more focus on the actual verbal teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, you will see the impact of Christ as he comes into this physical world. Now, I, I hope you are able to observe that as we were preaching to the Gospel of Luke, we, we are very slow, we are very deliberate, that we, we trace the birth of Jesus Christ, how he grew, and then his ministry, how he was tempted, how he called the twelve, and then when he started his ministry, what happened? And all these are unfolding chapter by chapter uh, with the Gospel of Luke before us. So I want you to bear in mind that we are now at a stage where Jesus just began his ministry and he began it with a lot of signs and wonders and the verbal teaching that he gave. 
and the impact that those teaching brought to the people around and what is the significance to us today. Let's come to the Lord in a prayer to commit the time into His hand. Let us pray. We thank you, God, once again for the opportunity to listen to your word. And with your word open before us, help us to be humble and teachable and help us to focus, be attentive so that we will not waste the opportunity to have your word come into our hearts and transform us. Have mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our heart and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight for your God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to be starting from Luke 6, verse 17. The Bible says, And he came down with them and stood on a level place. So I want you to know that he stood on a level place. With a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. So as I mentioned several sermons ago, when Jesus Christ appeared, it was a very, in Chinese it's called Hong Tong, it's a very big deal thing, because he was a worker of great signs and wonders. And even till today, you keep hearing that also oh, and so pastor is able to heal, so and so pastor is able to exorcise, and people get very, very excited about things like that, and they will go and flood the place. Now, one of the most famous charismatic healer is a person by the name of Benny Hinn. And uh, of course, Benny Hinn to us in the Reformed Evangelical Circle is very discredited because his theology is all over the place and most unbiblical. And on the internet, you can find a lot of examples. And he came to Singapore many years ago and he had a rally session at the National Stadium, which can seat about 60,000 people, you know, back in. That's an old national stadium. And a friend of mine said that he's going to go there and he invited me to, to join because he said there's going to be a healing session. And that's what Benny Hinn is kind of famous for. And he, and I said, no, you know, it's not my thing. We don't quite buy into this. And the next week when I met him again, I said, so how was the rally? He told me that he never made it to the rally. I said, why? He said that two hours before Benny Hinn were to start, the whole place already packed full of people. And so when he was driving there, he was turned away by the ushers who told him that you don't have to come in anymore because no way, you, there's no parking space, there's no nothing. And so he said he went away very disappointed. So you see the draw of this whole idea that great signs and wonders could have for the people. Till today, it's still a very, very big thing. But of course, uh, we don't quite buy the fact that healing is occurring in the same manner as the time of Jesus Christ. But you can see how it was, that the whole gang of people go after him. And uh, two sermons ago, we preached about the guy who was being lowered down to the roof, remember? Same thing, whole gang of people surrounded the house of possibly Peter, so much so that the sick man could not get close. And that's why they have to be very creative in the way they will reach him. And so you want to imagine that Jesus Christ is with all this whole gang of people. And the Bible says then in verse 19, And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And they were opportunity for Jesus Christ then to teach these people, even though they were there really for the miracles and for the signs and for the wonders, rather than just wanting to listen to him. And from this point onwards, we see some of the teachings of Jesus Christ being put together by the Apostle Luke as he was writing the Gospel of Luke. I want to remind you once again that these teachings may not be completely chronological, meaning it may not be that Jesus taught this and then followed up that in one sitting. The gospel authors often will put different teachings of Jesus together uh, to present it based on the theme that they want to portray to their readers. So the Bible tells us that right after this, the first thing that was taught is called the Beatitudes. And this is quite familiar to many of us. Earlier, Matthew read Matthew, you know, and he read the Beatitudes that we are more familiar with. The word beatitude actually comes from the Latin phrase beati sundat, which means blessed are. So in English translation, you have blessed are this, blessed this, blessed this, blessed this, blessed this. And in Latin, it's beati sundat, something, something, something. And so as a set then, we call it the beatitudes. Now we are very familiar with the one that was read earlier, which are Matthew's Sermon on the Mount series. Matthew tells us in Matthew 1, he went up on the mountain. So, and then said, blessed are these, blessed are that. 
in the case of Matthew 5, 1 to 11, there are listed about eight blessedness, or depends on your interpretation, could be nine as well. So in the Chinese translation, it's called Pa Fu, that means eight different kinds of blessing. But in Luke's sermon, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. Because earlier, as we have read verse 1, he came down to a place that is uh, a flat, level place. So therefore, you can see that there are at least two occasions where Jesus Christ taught the Beatitudes. One is on the mountain or on a hill, and the second one is on a plain. So Matthew's Sermon on the Mount is a lot more famous than Luke's Sermon on the Plain. Some of you may never even heard about this phrase, Sermon on the Plain, but here you, here you are. And that is found in Luke 6, 20-23. So in contrast, Luke's version has four blessedness. And so we see that Jesus Christ did teach many different teachings on many different occasions. This is why the gospel then would uh, have many different, different kind of story in different gospels because each gospel writer would have remembered by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit certain aspect of the teaching of Jesus Christ. It also tells us that Jesus did not teach only one thing one time. Often time he repeated the message for the people. A bit like pastors who go around preaching. After preaching to you, second service, there's one more preaching session. And actually, you, you won't know this. On weekdays, sometimes the sermons are repeated in other occasions as well. And the Bible then tells us in Luke 6 verse 20, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil. On account of the Son. So you want, this is the fourth blessing. So the first one, blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed if you are weeping or very sad now, for you shall laugh. And the, the, the fourth one, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil. Only when it is on account of the Son. Not because you are someone hated at your workplace and then you say, the Bible says I'm blessed. No, no. It's only when you are hated because you say you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Not because everybody hates you because you are a lousy supervisor or you don't do your job properly. That doesn't count. Huh? Only on account of the Son. And Jesus said, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. So, for so their fathers did to the prophet. Now, these are very odd kind of uh, uh, thinking, isn't it? That Jesus would talk about things that we would often not consider as blessing. I mean, going back to the passages again. Blessed are you who are poor. I mean, who wants to be poor, right? Uh, blessed are you who are hungry. I know many people who certainly do not want to be hungry. My oldest daughter is a foodie. You tell her to be hungry, she will kill me. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. How can weeping be something that is considered a blessing? The last one is a little bit easier to understand, I suppose. When people hate you on account of the sun, yeah, I suppose this can be considered blessing when you suffer for the sake of Lord Jesus Christ. But still, is this something that you want to do with your life? Uh, I've been blessed to be involved a little bit with the Papua New Guinea kind of mission. Our sister Eileen Riadi has been sending me a lot of updates and I'm always very, very appreciative of the missionaries that are on the ground. It's really tough. It's tough work, man, I tell you. And one of the things that she didn't tell people is that actually they are always under this threat by the people. There are many occasions, you know, they had to be evacuated because something happens and then, you know, the Papuans are very primitive people and they always think that we must kill the Ang Mo, <laughs> all these white people, white skinned people because they are the devil from in ancestor time or, or something like that. And so exactly as this, they hate them and exclude them and revile them and even want to kill them. So yeah, I suppose this one is easier to understand. But to the extent that Jesus said you should rejoice is something that's really, really very difficult. Because when we think about life, we often think that of course, it's more blessed to be 
rich, more blessed to be full, more blessed to be laughing all the time, and more blessed to be not persecuted by people, isn't it? And that's how it is, and especially even in religious kind of a setting. What we think in life really is quite different from what Jesus Christ thought. Now, you want to remember that that was like the first time many people heard teachings like this. Because we are so ingrained with the idea that blessing means you have a lot of things and you are peaceful, you are quite happy. That, that thought sort of trigger all the way till today, you know. Everywhere you go, it's still the same thing. It's a bit like the Sabbath law. People are thinking to themselves, how can it be that Sabbath we work? So therefore, 39 categories, right? It basically lasted all the way till today. And even more so like this. Whatever religion you go to, other than Christianity, when you think about blessing, you are thinking about having a lot of things. And, uh, uh, you know, Singapore is very strict, anti <laughs> A religious harmony law, so you cannot talk about other religion. Right? So Greek religion, Plutus, Plutus is the god of wealth, and uh, in all depiction of the god of wealth for the Greek mythology, is always someone who is spilling a lot of money down from his unending box of treasure, and that, that's what being blessed means. And indeed, that's the case with any other faith out there, and there are many faith that has god or goddesses of wealth out there and whenever you look at all these goddesses on the painting and depiction it's always about a lot of money flowing everywhere right and so you pray to them so that they will bless you with the same thing uh, in chinese understanding it's a little bit mur mur murky for example you see a toad like this have you seen this before in offices somewhere uh, it's a toad that has a coin in his mouth and it's always gold in color. The eye is emerald or ruby or actually it's plastic, basically. <laughs> Surrounded with all kinds of depiction of gold. And do you know what's so special about the toad? Who knows how many legs this toad have? A three-legged toad. And there's a whole story behind this. And I can bring this out because this is not really about religion. This is more like feng shui kind of a thing. So they won't arrest me for that. And even as close to us as Japan... The idea that money is very important is seen in the Japanese uh, welcoming cat, which in Japanese is called Maniki Niko. And you tour Japan, you see all the time. This cat that will keep waving at you to say, you, you come. And supposedly you put a cat in front of your store, people will come. But one look at this cat, I know that this cat is a Chinese modification of the Japanese version. Do you know how I know? The amount of gold at the bottom. Because the original Chinese maniki Nikko cat only carry one coin. That's all. Very contented. One coin good enough. But when you go to China, all of a sudden you get a pile of gold right below. Then there's something about the green emerald uh, ring. And you can find on the internet description of what everything uh, represents. So that's uh, the idea of being blessed, right? I mean, you want to be blessed, you need to, to have a lot of things. And lest you think that that's only related to other religions. In the Christian world, it is becoming something that is quite popular today as well. I was looking for things like greeting cards and I found this one. I wish you many, many happy returns of the day. May God bless you with health, wealth and prosperity in your life. Happy birthday. So this is one of the greeting cards that I saw. And it's very common. When you say, if God bless you, of course, He will have to bless you with health, with wealth, and prosperity and this is like everybody thinks like that and this idea that you are blessed when you're poor cannot really be right so till today people will write books like god wants you to be rich the christian guide to financial freedom and unlimited wealth unlimited wealth 12 ways to bring more money into your life while still serving the lord yes. i mean this is the best of all world right you say you serve the lord at the same time you must you know Make money at the same time. So it will make more sense than what Jesus Christ has said. And I experienced this many, many years ago with the publication of a very unusual book called The Prayer of Jabez. And how many of you have read this book? Heard of this book? Only a few of you very old people. You know. Prayer of Jabez was released in the year 2000. And it was a, a, it, it was a very popular book till today. Prayer of Jabez is listed as one of the best-selling Christian books ever. It has sold about more than 10 million books 
globally. The Prayer of Jabez is written by a guy called Bruce Wilkinson, who is a theologian, okay? I mean, he has a PhD in theology and, and what have you. He is a theologian who teaches theology. And what's the Prayer of Jabez all about? Bruce Wilkinson found a verse in the Bible in First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. So First Chronicles chapter 4 is about the genealogy of Judah, the, the descendant. You know, Bible, sometimes when you read, you come across gene- genealogy, especially in Old Testament, right? This guy give birth to this guy, give birth to this guy, give birth to this guy. I was told by my doctor friend that if you cannot sleep at night, you go and read those things. You know, you really, really will fall asleep. So in the genealogy of Judah, this particular verse appeared that this guy called Jabez, one of the descendants, was named Jabez because the mother had a hard time giving birth to him. So the word Jabez means hard labor or something like that. So please don't name your children Jabez. Jabez called upon the name God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you will bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you will keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. Now, before Bruce Wilkerson wrote the prayer of Jabez, nobody, I mean nobody in the history of the church, has ever noticed this verse because this verse like pop up in the middle of nowhere. But Bruce Wilkinson made a whole theology out of just one verse in the Bible and he wrote the prayer of Jabez and, and said that actually the verse tells you that you, you should call upon God and said, bless me and enlarge my border and be with me so that I may be kept away from harm. And then from there come an entire industry of how to pray to God to get what you want so that you could use the wealth to do the work of God. And the prayer of Jabez became very big. And then the prayer of Jabez for children, prayer of Jabez for old people, prayer of Jabez for businessmen, all kinds of things. And it is a brand new thing altogether. So you see how very, very strong this idea that being blessed means materialistically blessed. I mean, don't talk to me about any other thing. Show me the money, you know, because that's the way everybody thinks about it, including very seasoned theologians out there. Now, the teachings of Jesus Christ did not just end with the four blessings in Luke, right? These are Sermon of the Plain. The other part of it that is a little bit more difficult even is the next set, which are the four woes. And this is unique only to the Gospel of Luke, meaning you cannot find in the Gospel of Matthew. Because of Matthew had the eight or nine beatitudes without this next four. This next four is only found in the Gospel of Luke. And so it's quite unusual and quite special. Verse 24, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. So this is in contrast with the other four, blessed are you. So blessed are you, woe are you. And these are very frightening verses on the surface. And many people get very disturbed by this and don't know what to do with it. And indeed, through the history of the church, many people interpret it quite differently. For example, uh, verse 25, Woe to you who laugh now. And in medieval times, there were teachings that laughing is a tool of Satan. So cannot laugh. Pastors like me who sometimes crack joke and make all of you laugh will burn in hell because woe to you when you laugh now for you shall not, you shall mourn and weep. Many, many, many years ago, there was a very old movie called The Name of the Rose starring Sean Connolly. How many people watched that before? I always feel very old uh, when I'm with you guys. The, the show is about Sean Connolly at that time, still quite young, I think. He was like a monk, like Sherlock Holmes or the monk. Like. It's a very strange story, actually. Uh, then he went to a, a monastery to try to investigate mysterious death. And, and in the end, the mysterious death was traced to an abbot of the monastery. That means the head of the monastery. Because this abbot believed that laughter is the tool of the devil. So anybody who laughs, he go and murder them one by one. So that was, that's a very strange storyline. So don't laugh because woe to you who laugh now, for you shall then mourn and weep. So how do you make of this? Because these teachings are so upside down from what we are 
very used to, right? And so it becomes very jarring. So can you imagine there you are among the crowd listening to this guy called Jesus Christ who is able to do such great wonders and heal people. And those things you cannot escape, right? I mean, the guy was paralyzed and he stand up and walk. Fellow with the withered hand was healed, exorcism and, and what have you. But then he come out and tell you all these things that are so strange and so difficult to understand. And so how do you deal with this? Uh, before I go, I want to first of all tell you that the word woe really means sad are you, regret are you, not curse, uh, not, not you're cursed because you're rich or you curse because you're happy. No, it doesn't, you are, you're going to be regretful if you are rich, for you have received your consolation. And so all in all, the teachings of Jesus Christ, when he first appeared, eh, was very tough for people. You, In a nutshell, what happened is that Jesus said, the people whom Jesus called happy, the world will call wretched. Right? I mean, he said, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are those who, who are persecuted. The world will look at it and say, see how are you? These people are, are wretched. They have a terrible, terrible life. The people Jesus called wretched, the world will call happy. And that's what William Barclay said. Because Jesus said, woe be to you if you are rich. And the world will say, no, they are quite happy. Like, <laughs> woe be to you if you are full. He said, no, everyone wants to be full. Who wants to be hungry? And woe be to you if people say good things about you. I mean, that's what all we want. William Barclay, the theologian, said, this is exactly what happened in the set out there. And so the teachings of Jesus Christ was indeed pretty upside down looking at the way we are quite used to the kind of teaching we have in our life. So how do you understand this, all, all these things? And let me be very clear to you. Now, first of all, the teaching of Jesus Christ were really not completely about wealth and poverty. I have preached from this pulpit before that by design of God Almighty, we are all given the potential to do better and to be bigger than who we are today. And this is how God designed us to be. And so the desire to create, the desire to be better, the desire to move towards ultimately perfection is something which we all should do. And so you should not go through life thinking, the Chinese says, That means when I study, I am not very ambitious. I just want to pass and that's about it. 60 marks, quite happy. And, and you think that's a very good thing because I'm very contented, ma? No, no, no. The Bible always encourages us to do better, to be the best that we can be. Which school is it? The slogan is the best is yet to be. I ah, yes, yeah, my rival school. What, what am I saying? I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but it's a good slogan. The best is yet to be, that you, you always want to be better. And so in a normal situation, a Christian should be better, faster, bigger, more creative, all through his life, always learning. And I'm, I'm always learning new things. Like I, I just learned fish and chip is part of the, the Sabbath thing. It, it's new, it's exciting, it's fun. And so if you run a business, you should become bigger, 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 and better and better and better because that's how God made you. And so there's nothing wrong with achieving more and by natural consequence, it means that you will be richer and richer and, and richer. And it is marvelous how all these things come together and how things move. A couple of days ago, I, I had the uh, privilege of visiting one of the local MNC company from America. And it's just amazing, right? This company gives free food, free nuts, free everything. And it's like, what you look at the human ingenuity in in. in the human genius in coming up with things. It's just very incredible to see that what oh, human being can think about this. This is quite cool. Huh? Well, they got pinball machine, they got this, they got that. And it's just marvelous that human being can expand our thought to do more things. And so please, it's Jesus Christ is not saying that, hey man, if you are want to do better, something is wrong with you. Or you are if you are rich because you have applied your God given talent to you, something is wrong with you. I have made it quite clear that the Bible tells us that we ought to do more because God has designed us with a potential that is actually quite unlimited. So how do you make of the teachings of Jesus Christ? The key verse actually is found in verse 24 when Jesus said, Woe to you who are rich, 
for you have received your consolation. So the key verse and the key to understanding all this whole set is this phrase, for you have received your consolation. Jesus Christ thought that if your hope is only on being rich, on being full, on being happy here and now, then you have already received your consolation. In other words, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you think that the purpose of my life is to be rich, is to be happy here, and to be full, and that's all I do, then that's it. There's really nothing for you in your life more than all these things or in the life to come because you have already received your consolation here and now. And so, if you put all your focus on living well in this life alone, Jesus Christ was saying to you, you are sad. It is regretful because you missed it. You would enjoy your life now, but that's it. You have already received everything that you can possibly receive. And life is a lot more than this. And so, one of the sayings that's going around quite well these few days, uh, these few years, because of Chen Suipian in Taiwan, is the saying that some people are so poor that all they have is money. I want you to... <laughs> can you memorize this? All people are so poor that all you have is money. Even when you look at this phrase, uh, you say to yourself, how can that be? It doesn't make cow sense. Because, of course, I want a lot of money. Being poor means I have no money. La. Then if I have money, how can I be poor? But this phrase says all... People are so poor, all they have is money. Why was this linked with the ex-president of Taiwan, Chen sui bian You know, the ex-president of Taiwan went to jail, right, because of corruption and, and what have you. And his son went to give him a book when he was in prison. And somehow the journalist took picture and all that, and the book cover title came out in, in Chinese. Read, the book was written by a pastor, Chong Dao Zi Shen Xia Qian. I mean, you are so poor that all you have left is money. And same phrase, some people are so poor, all they have is money. In other words, other than being rich, huh, there is nothing. You have no thoughts, you have no contribution, the world is not a better place because of you, your employees are not getting a better life because of you, you're not changing the world, you're not making life better for anybody because of you, you, you have no opinion about anything, ask you anything, you also don't know, music also don't know, art also don't know, Simi Wako also don't know, you are very poor. So when Chen Sui Bin's book became public knowledge, all of Taiwan was very shocked that there is such a pastor who wrote a book like that, that someone can be so poor until all they have is money. Guess what happened next? The newspaper did a survey in Taipei, going around asking the people on the street, would you rather be so poor that all you have left is money? What do you think? The vast majority of the people say, of course, of course I want to be so poor that all I have is money. It's very scary that how the world thinks. You know, in China, there's another phrase. A girl will say to the guy, 我宁愿坐在你的宝马里面哭, 也不愿意坐在你的自行车上笑。I would rather sit in your BMW and cry than ride on your bicycle and laugh. It's like, wow. That means that you must marry what? The rich. So yeah, marry rich. I am, I am happy to sit behind your BMW and cry. Whoa, my husband got a fair. Whoa, whoa. But it's okay, I got Chanel. <laughs> you know, well, it's okay, I got LV back. I would rather sit in your BMW and cry then right behind your bicycle and sing Tiemi Mi Mi Tiemi Mi because we are poor. And it's like, wow, you know, that's, that's how the world thing, isn't it? And, and, and all you have left is money. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ was saying, that you don't want a situation where all you are left with money because if that's all you are focused on, then... You are lost indeed, and woe be to you indeed. So, the upside down of teachings of Jesus Christ is pointing out to us that life is a lot more than just being wealthy and happy here and now. And while we do not reject wealth, 
The fact is that the Bible is very clear about this. Wealth and temporal happiness would draw us away from God and generate a great sense of arrogance and reliance on the fallen world's value. Because these things have the tendency to bring us away from God to unto ourselves. To say to ourselves that it's all about me. If I'm wealthy, it's because I'm very clever. I'm very good. I know how to do business. I know how to see the loophole. I know how to run a big organization. So it's all about me. If I'm happy now, I'm happy. I'm not going to think about anything else. I just want to enjoy my life right here and right now. Who cares about what other people do? Who cares about the poor? Who cares about those who are not happy? Because it's all about me. And this is why Jesus Christ said, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are not full. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Because when you're at that stage, you will keep trying to go for God, right? When you're poor, you say, Oh God, why am I poor? Why, why, why is this happening to me? I want to seek you more. Can you tell me the answer? I want to go to church. I want to find out more from the pastor. Why am I suffering and why am I going through life in this way? But that's very unlikely to happen when you are wealthy and when you are healthy and when everything is smooth. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you need to be wary when everything is going on very smoothly because it has a tendency to draw you away from God. And that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. But it goes against everything that we are used to because of our fallen state. I don't know whether you heard properly our chairperson Paul's prayer earlier. And he prayed that, you know, we, we, we are wretched people. We are sinners. I know many people, when they hear things like that, they say nonsense, like, you know, I come to church, you tell me I'm a sinner. You tell me I, I have no worth. You tell me I'm I, 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 I scumbag. That's not true. I'm somebody, man, you know. So don't go and tell me that I'm a sinner. And that's why a lot of people don't want to come to church, especially the Orthodox Church. They, they find that the Orthodox Church always do this. A couple of days ago, I heard someone share, and he, he said that you need to believe in Jesus because Jesus died for you because you are worth it. You are worth it. And so Jesus died for you. And listen, listen, I said that, hey man, the guy got the theology a bit wrong. So I wrote to him and said, you got it wrong, you know. We are not worthy. We are only worth something because Jesus died for us. Not we are worth something so Jesus died for us. You know, there is a very subtle but important difference. You are saying that this human being is worth something. So be, therefore, Jesus died for you. In Reform Evangelical Understanding, no, 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 the other way around. Jesus died for you, so you are worth something. So it, it's fascinating that the way we think is always about me. I am very important, so God must come and die for me. Jesus Christ said no. You need to understand that you need to rely on God. And those who are poor, those who are desperate, those who are hungry are a lot more blessed because then they will they will be more willing to go forward to God. And so that's the key upside-down teaching of Jesus Christ. The teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ as he appeared were radically different from the understanding of the religious leaders. As I have mentioned to you before, so different that till today, we still don't get it. You, you still have people preaching about prosperity and health and wealth and all that. His revelation that he is the Messiah, God in the flesh, was the worst of all the upside-down teaching. Because of that, people found a perfect excuse for him to be killed. And so the Jews gathered together to kill him. But I want to tell you that, as we have read, other teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ also challenged the conventional wisdom of the fallen world. Back then, now and for many, many more years to come until Jesus Christ will come again. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when you read the Bible and all the teachings of the Bible, I don't know what goes through your mind, you know. I, I mean, can you imagine listening to Jesus talk about all this? First time you hear him. I mean, you guys are Christian. You have heard it many times, perhaps Sermon on the Mount and all that. For the people back then, first time they hear him. I mean, why should we listen to you? Jesus Christ. And it's so strange the things you have said. When we look at the teachings of Jesus Christ and all the pretty hard and shocking teaching of Jesus Christ, I wonder whether you ask this question, why should I listen to this guy? 
it was it just being clever, trying to figure out new things and, and trying to put a twist into old teaching? What is it? Why should I listen to him? There is a professor in Harvard University called Howard Gardner. He proposed that human intelligence has many different types. So he proposed eight different types. In Singapore, we only care about the one of the eight, logical, mathematical. So your school, your PSLE, all that, they focus very much on that. Right? So sometimes your kids are, are, don't do well in those areas, and then you get very upset. Howard Gardner said that intelligence can be found in many areas. Music, visual, that means music, you're very good at music. Visual, you are good at the arts. Verbal, you are very good at talking. Uh, logical, mathematics. Kinestic, where you are very good at physical, like your Tiger Woods, right? After all these things, he still can win. And, and interpersonal intelligence. Some of you are very good at EQ. My wife is especially good at that. Very strong. Intrapersonal ability to look into yourself. And so if you measure a child who is gifted in other areas, just by mathematical, logical, then the fellow will fail. So not very fair to him. In recent years, Howard Garner proposed that perhaps one more category must be added into it. Moral and existentialist, meaning religious. He, some people are religiously intelligent. Was Jesus Christ like that, a religious genius, ability to look at moral issues and come up with a different idea? Who are you listening to in your life when you look at his teaching? What are your consideration points? as we approach the teaching of Jesus Christ. And there are more teachings to follow, right? I just pointed out to you only the pity tales. There's a love the enemies, judging others, a tree and his fruit, build your house on a rock. Every single one of them are upside down teachings. And why should I listen to him? Who is this person? So you should ask yourself the question, why should you listen to all this upside down teaching of Jesus Christ? I mean, in life, we listen to many different people, right? For example, all these very ancient philosopher people on the left, you have Confucius. So if you are very Chinese as I am, many of Confucius' teaching permeates our life. Sometimes we spew it out of your mouth without knowing, no? The way we treat our children, we treat our spouse, based a lot on Confucius' teaching. And then the one in the middle is Socrates, westernized kind of a teaching. Socrates said many things that, that are quite fascinating. Like, for example, unexamined life is not worth living. It means that if your life is not tried, no testing, then it's not worth very much. And then, of course, on the right-hand side is, is Buddhist teaching. And you must know that Buddhism is not a religion. It's actually a philosophy. And I'm influenced by a lot of Buddhist teaching. For example, the concept of a moment in thought, in yan zi cha, uh, this is a very high level kind of thinking. The, the teaching is that in yan tian tang, in yan di yu, just one speck of a difference in your thought will land you in heaven or land you in hell. This is very advanced thinking. So that's the case in life very often, right? When you're at the crossroad of life. Do I want to tolerate my wife or do I want to bash her kid against the wall? Just one thought different. And some people choose the second one, uh, including a doctor who said he was blacking out right, when he was drunk or whatever. It's just one thought different. Just one thought. Can you master that one thought, that, that split second moment? And this is a Buddhist teaching. It's quite fascinating. And closer to, to our age then, there are other people like these three fellows that I, I, I look to. You have Mahama Gandhi, our friend in the middle, okay, why? Dalai Lama. Now, LKY is very missed today, you know. You know why not? People is asking, Hong Kong, what should we do? Hong Kong, what should we do? If, if Akong is around, you ask Akong, Akong will tell you. The, 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 crush them, you know. My, my friends from Hong Kong asking me, how come like this? What do you think? I said, if LKY is around, you won't have this happening in Hong Kong. So my friends say, how can that be? I say, very simple. What? When NUS, NTU, whatever student, when you are discussing a demonstration, we already arrest you. <laughs> Correct? Huh? Just discussing, no need to hit the street one. We, we already arrest you. Am I being recorded? I am, right? So anyway, he's not around with you, so I'm not afraid. <laughs> so, so all these people, the wisdoms of, of, of them, hey, you cannot deny, right? A friend is wise beyond the usual. And, but uh, two of them did. This one's still alive. And closer to home, normal culture. All these people, uh, people listen to. Some very young, 16-year-old, already 
prominent in the world, everybody listening, everybody hearing so-called wisdom. This guy I put here because I cracked my brain, I still cannot think of another living Asian guy that we are listening to. Can you suggest some face other than him? Anybody? Anyone? Like a statue or LKY kind of thing? Don't have, right? So no choice. I use the, the sun to put, it, put his face there. If you think of anyone uh, after the service, kind of tell me, they will replace the face with someone else. <laughs> uh, Ellen DeGeneres. Impactful, okay? Our friend has his, her talk show and he's like, you know how many people influence? Time Magazine lists her as one of the most influential people under the sun. And of course, this guy on the left, I want no choice because he so happened to hold the most powerful position in the world. And everybody say a lot of things, a lot of theories, a lot of teachings. Compared to them, where is the upside down teaching of Jesus Christ, the pititudes, the woes? Is it one of the creative thinking? The key question, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as we then, from this point onwards, move into some of the more solid teaching of Jesus Christ, is the question, who is Jesus Christ to you? The fact is this. The revelation of God Almighty to humanity is progressive in nature. It means that God revealed His will to us through history, not one time everything down, but throughout history, developing and slowly revealing from Genesis all the way to where we are today and the completion of the Bible. The Old Testament teaches about the attributes and commands of God. His design for us, His righteousness versus our unrighteousness and many, many things and how the world was formed, that we all know. And many of the will of God is already seen actually in the Old Testament as He points to our Lord Jesus Christ. Still in the past sermons, you see that our fallen nature will continue to plunge us all into darkness. Sabbath law is very good for us to rest and point to the Messiah, but then immediately the religious leader come with 1,001 different rules. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Religious leaders say, don't even mention the name of God. And I just point out to you, even in the secular world, Jack Ma formed a company, say we must think out of the box, we must, we must think creatively, because I have no prominent degree, my life sucks, but then, you know, I'm very creative. Still, finally, he cannot get hired by his own company. This is a fallen nature of man, keep messing things up. And in the history of the world then, our Lord Jesus Christ culminates the revelation of God when he came to the world to then fully reveal to us, out of all the mess in the world, what God's will is really all about. And the Gospel of John illustrates this very well. In John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus Christ has made God the Father known to us all. And so, with all the mess in the world, Jesus came to illuminate us as to what God is all about. And John said that was his purpose. And the revelation of God finds its highest point in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible is very clear about this. Another place that talks about this is Colossians 1.19. For in him... All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This means that Jesus Christ has come, we all know, to save us. That, that's number one. The other thing that's very important for you to know is that Jesus Christ has come to show us the truth, to illuminate us in the midst of our darkness. The words and lives of Jesus Christ, therefore, they were not just very clever opinion or very creative philosophical understanding. They are directly from God himself. Because in the midst of great darkness, Christ came to illuminate the world for us. This is why the Bible consistently talks about him with words like light. Back to John again. John 1 put it this way. In the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is why when we read the teachings of Jesus Christ, it stands out radically different from everybody else because we are in darkness and the light has come and it shines in darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. So when you see the words of Christ and the teachings by extension of the entire Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit, you must not think that it's just one of the many teachings out there, one of the many saying, one of the bumper stickers, uh, soundbite. You must understand it as a direct revelation of God, especially the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why some Bibles are the red letter edition Bible. Anybody have Bibles like this where the words of Christ is in red color? Anybody? Only a couple, uh, quite a few of you. The red letter Bible is actually a very recent invention, you know, only in like 1900 did this practice came about. That a guy called Louis Glatch, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, very strange spelling. He suddenly was inspired to think that, hey, I think the words of Jesus Christ are a little bit different because Jesus said, a new covenant I give to you, this cup is the covenant of my blood. So he think that the blood of Jesus is red in color. Words of Jesus should be then printed in red. And we become very popular. The word of Jesus Christ all printed in red to signify that the direct word of the Son of God has more significant than any other words. Now, there's some theological issue here because we believe that the words of the apostles and Paul and all that, they are all inspired by the Holy Spirit. But even senior pastor Dr. Stephen Tong believed that the direct word of the Son of God should carry a little bit more weight. But my point to you is that these are not ordinary words. These are words that are going to transform the whole world because it's the truth of God. And sometimes it takes us a long time to recognize it. And I see that in the apostles. So we are now traveling with the life of Jesus. He just started, he called his apostles. And the apostles are going to witness a lot of miracles, a lot of things, a lot of happening. And I note that in the three and a half years they were with Jesus Christ, they sort of took a long time, you know, to understand the significance of Jesus bit by bit. So it's no surprise that we too oftentimes will take a long time to understand the significance. For example, in John chapter 6, verse 67, Jesus did a miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. After that, he began to teach about how you're going to eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, and the people all left him, except the final 12. So Dr. Tong used this as an example of ministry, sometimes in an odd way. Starting feeding 5,000 plus women, and 5,000 plus children, and maybe 2,000. So it becomes a feeding of the 12,000. From 12,000 become 12 at the end of chapter 6. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed. And have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so the word of God is, are the words of eternal life. The words of Christ especially are the words of eternal life. The words of truth, the words of eternity, much, much higher than the words of Lee Kuan Yew or Gandhi or even Buddha or whoever they may be. The Westminster Confession of Faith then declared this way. In chapter 1 of the Holy Scripture, section 6, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life is either explicitly set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from scripture. What this means is that the word of God illuminate us and deliver us from darkness, from ignorance, from confusion, from being lost, from being timid, from being fearful, from being worried. Whatever it is that you are encountering in life and in faith, you will find the answer in the Word of God. That's what the Westminster is saying. Whether by direct words or by deduction on the general principles of the Bible. This is why we look at the Bible as the truth. And we follow the commands of God because Jesus Christ came to illuminate it to us. 
but we find it very difficult, just as those people in the early days find it difficult because our mind is so very fallen. But my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when you finally get it, when you finally understand that Jesus Christ was not just one of the many prophets, one of the many wise guys, or Howard Gardner said, existentialist and moral genius, when you finally understand life is going to be very, very different. And in the Bible, as I said, sometimes it takes a while for the disciples to get it. I will quote two examples for you and I will end. In Matthew 16, 13, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do you say Jesus Christ, me, is? And they said, some say you are John the Baptist, Others say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Because great, man, your teaching was so great, very wise, and you can do signs and wonders. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning you need to ask yourself the question, you know. All these teachings about Jesus Christ, right? When it is said, you feel resistant. I want to remind you once again, uh, when Jesus said, Woe to you who are rich. Please don't go and look around and say, you're talking about you, not talking about me. <laughs> I always believe that every person in Singapore, if you are in Singapore, you belong to the rich. Was it in the newspaper two couple of days ago that says that top 10% of the wealthiest people in Singapore, something like how many percent? You, you didn't know that, right? <laughs> you said, what are you talking about? I'm not, he's not describing me. You go around this world, you, this region, you will see that that's true. You know the mess in Hong Kong, you know what's the problem? Problem is that they can no housing. The average Hong Kong young man, like all these young people, you've got to work 17 years, don't eat, don't drink, save every single cent, then you can buy a little apartment no larger than our toddler's room, you know. And, and that's why people go to the street. So don't kind of tell me that you are poor because compared to the rest of the world, it's referring to you. And so you look at all this teaching, you know, What's your reaction? It depends on this phrase. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when Simon Peter said that, Jesus said that, Look here, you didn't figure it out by yourself. The Father gave you the revelation. But since you declare this, the keys of heaven is upon you. And the church will be built upon this foundation. But it was a turning point in the life of Simon Peter. Although he was still weak, right? Later on, he still denied Christ and what have you. Are you able to say the same? You look at Jesus Christ. You are the Christ. You are son of the living God. Another example is found in the later chapters of John 20. After Jesus resurrected. Remember Thomas always doubting. Perhaps it's the case with all of us. Looking at the words. Pastor said this. Yeah, la, maybe, la, maybe not. La. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe I pick and choose, Lord, whatever I like. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, Thomas with them. Thomas was also the same. You say he resurrected, are you sure or not? Unless I poke his wound, uh, if not, I will never believe. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. You doubt, right? You say that I have not been resurrected, right? You say that you put your finger at my wound, then you will believe. Here I am. Do it. Do not disbelieve. Just believe. And what did Thomas say? Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And, and that's where he got it. And when Thomas fully understands who Jesus is, he expressed two things that all of us must as well. That Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my God. Two together. Because if he is just my Lord and not my God, you will miss the salvation point altogether. But if he is just God and not Lord, then you live your life any way you want. When you say Jesus is Lord, it means that, as Paul said earlier, you don't longer live for yourself, you know, because he's Lord, he's Master. So I live my life with him as my Lord. Yes, I may not do it tomorrow, but progressively I move towards that direction. 
when you say that He is your God, it means that I will trust in every single word that He say because He is God. And so I leave you with this question. With all the hard teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, the key question is, who is Jesus to you? May we all be able to answer, He is my Lord and He is my God. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the word that we have heard. And perhaps like the people back then, we find it very difficult to understand and even accept. And so much so that today there are still many people who preach about the things of the world rather than the things of the kingdom of God. So we acknowledge our weakness before you. And as Paul prayed earlier, we seek for extra mercy, extra grace from you so that we will come a bit closer to understanding who you are. So that when we read the very tough teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will no longer resist him with our worldly knowledge, but we are willing to be obedient and submit to him as our Lord and our God. For he was not just one of the clever teachers in the history of mankind. He is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. Grants to us this understanding so that we have a living relationship with him that will help us understand that this is not just a religion, this is a revelation, a relationship. But again, we are weak, but we know you are strong. So help us to be humble, that we may live the life that Jesus Christ came to give to us. Not only live it, but live it abundantly. Listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.